come on my love it's not that bad Away. All righty. Well, hell to the O, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back. And it's getting a bit deep into the year now. We're deep into autumn, and that means that the fine, lovely, warm summer riding days are now a thing of the past and the riding days in front of me are numbered because very soon it will start to get cold and icy and that will signal the end of my riding season for yet another year but before that happens there's still the odd day like this where it's chilly but it's bright and more importantly it's dry so i just thought i'd go back for a little ride on my uh, 09 today and see what it was about In the last couple of years of my riding I've sort of wrapped the year up to myself not necessarily in vlog format but I've kind of had to think about what I've learned most that year and the last sort of three to four years it's been mainly about my track riding because that's been the new big thing in my life but uh, this year slightly different because I've changed my I've certainly changed my garage around quite a bit as I normally tend to do but in changing my bikes I've kind of reached a sort of grand realization in my life about the kind of bikes that I enjoy riding now so I'll just slow down for horsey here oh big old horsey and basically when I first started this channel, I think it was back in 2013, I think, I was, uh, I had just uh, got rid of uh, an FJR 1300, a Yamaha. Now the reason why I got rid of it was because at that point, I was kind of at the point of giving up bikes completely because I had ended up on this big Yamaha which was a lovely design built bike don't get me wrong it was an absolute limousine to ride and the build quality was phenomenal but the five speed very low revving 180 degree in line four was a very dull and uninspiring engine in my opinion uh, and I was feeling a little bit disillusioned with motorbikes and that's why I bought the street triple Sorry, not the Street Triple, the Speed Triple, the 1050, which reinvigorated my riding because it's, it was all of a sudden, it was back to riding a, a nice sporty bike. But the bike that I'd actually wanted to buy instead of the, the Street was actually the Aprilia Tuono V4R. But at the time I couldn't afford it. So in 2014, I ended up buying the uh, Aprilia Tuono, my dream bike as it was at the time. And that in itself was a real high watermark in my bike ownership. And then I saw the 2016 R1 and that again, that, that just lit a fire of desire in me because I'd never owned an R1 before and I'd always wanted one and thought, you know what, let's buy one while I can. So I bought one and as you know, if you've been following my channel long enough, I rode it on both road and track. Latterly more on track than on the road. Ah, too high a gear, that's why it won't lift. And uh, and the thing that the that progression of bike ownership kind of led me into uh, drawing an opinion on. And I, and I sort of come to this conclusion quite early on in the ownership of my Pilia Tuono that these days, these 1000cc sports bikes and sporty super nakeds are just phenomenally powerful and in my opinion, and people may not agree, but especially in the UK and by UK largely pretty much every old world European nation the road infrastructure and the laws of the land are just... 
the, those bikes, those class of bikes are just too damn powerful to use to their fullest extent. Now, unless you ride that bike on track, and in this instance I'll, uh, I'll defer to my R1 for example, unless you ride that, that uh, 2015 plus R1 on track, you're not going to get anything like the available performance out of it on the road safely and legally. And even on track, those bikes are so good, they are so powerful and so capable that unless you're a high-end racer, unless you're a stock thousand superbike racer, you know, something of that kind of calibre, you're not getting the most out of that bike again. And I'm a fast track day rider, and towards the end I was doing pretty damn fast laps on that R1, but even I was only really scratching the surface of just what that bike was capable of. So, which is ultimately why I ended up selling it in the end, because I'd had my fun, and so I looked around to see what I would like to return to and that's when I started testing the smaller capacity sports bikes like uh, like this and it was the actual the Triumph Speed Triple correction the Triumph Street Triple RS that I tested a couple of years ago that really kind of reignited my love for the what is now called a mid-weight class of bike that sort of 600 to well now these days 900 class of bike that hover around the 110 to 120 horsepower bracket and it was riding that bike that just suddenly thought you know what you don't need all this power to have fun and in fact and i actually said it on the review i had on this very same road but going the other way I actually had more fun riding that uh, Triumph Street Triple RS than I'd had on my R1 all year. And that's no BS, that. that is absolute truth. It was just in that one little one hour ride I'd had so much more fun. And it was kind of at that point I decided, right, the R1 goes on track and I'll look at getting a replacement. It was at the time going to be this Street Triple RS until I tried this baby here, the MT-09. And I've already done videos as to why I chose this bike over the street. Both are awesome. Both are the correct bike. It's just all down to your personal preference. And since I've been riding this bike over this last uh, year, and really bonding with it and just having an absolute fun year on it. And it is the most fun bike I've ridden in since I kind of started when I used to be really excited when I first got my RD350 power valve YPVS, the F2 model, which at the time was a two-stroke 350 twin cylinder, 60 odd horsepower. It was a pretty, pretty fast bike that, and unless you've ridden uh, you know, a, a two-stroke uh, multi-cylinder bike of that sort of calibre, you, you know, it was an old bike, but my God, it was fast. And now, going back again to my uh, dark and distant uh, youth, I used to look at uh, motorbikes with a very, very aspirational eye. I have, I've loved bikes ever since I first ever rode one. Uh, when I would have been about 11 years old, the first ever time I rode a motorcycle, and it was a Yamaha DT175, a uh, kind of dirt bike looking thing, and I rode it on some fields, and it, to me it was just the fastest thing ever, and to, for me to have this power under my wrist was just intoxicating, and from then I was just, that was it, I'm going to ride motorbikes, and so I turned 16, I got a 50cc road bike, which is the most you could ride in the UK, age 16. And I progressed through the normal channels to the 125, uh, rode a 125 for a couple of years and then passed my test. And then in them days, you could just pass your test at 17 and ride any bike you wanted. Thankfully, it's better now and they have a direct access scheme, which keeps things a bit more sensible because, my God, there were death traps back then. But anyway, now when I was an aspirational young lad looking at these motorbikes, at the time, the bikes that I was looking at 
a big bike. People say, oh, look at his big bike. It was a 750. That tended to be the biggest bikes you would see on the road. There was the odd thousand knocking about at that time. And I'm going back to the 1980s here. But since its launch as a brand, as a trademark, if you will, Superbike, especially like World Superbike Championship and the British Superbike Championship, from my point of reference, the Superbike class, the top class, because obviously like all racing weekends, they would have support races. So you'd have back then, it'd be your 125s, 250s, both two strokes, and you'd have your main class, which would be the 750 production Superbikes. So we're looking at Yamaha FZR 750s, Suzuki GSX R 750, the Honda, the RC 30, the V4, things like that. Those were the fast bikes of the time, and you had big name riders racing them. And and at that, and sort of towards the end of the 80s, you started to get more and more litre plus like super bikes. The, I think the first one that I remember, and I might be wrong, it might not be the first one, but of the modern era of fully fed race super bikes. The first one I remember seeing about was the GSXR 1100. Now back then there was all kinds of odd incongruous engine capacities knocking about on bikes. You would have 850s, 750s, 700s, 900s, 950s. It was all manufacturers kind of went all over the shop, coming with a until they all kind of settled on a, a basic uh, platform that customers seemed to want, and it was a market-driven uh, design process. So that's how you ended up with. 600s, 750s, 1000s, 1100s, 1200s, 1300s, things like that. But in the superbike world, it was 750 was always the pinnacle. But then came the 1990s and then it started to get the GSXR 1000s, the uh, Fireblade arrived around that time, and the superbike classes moved up to that uh, size of engine capacity. Now back then they were still putting out about 150, 160 engine horsepower which would equate to about 130 at the back wheel for the road which was plenty but since then an arms race took off and there used to be a kind of gentleman's agreement with the uh, manufacturers that they limited themselves to 100 horsepower for a few years for street bikes then that kind of there was a, there was someone would break the treaty and bring it then eventually over the years we've ended up where now the unless it's got 200 horsepower people aren't interested so and that's where I found myself now when I used to look back at things like the Suzuki GS750 the Z750 bikes of that nature or Z750 to give it its name by our uh, American cousins and transatlantic cousins those are the bikes I was looking at and I used to actually own a, a, a Z750 uh, back in the early 1990s it was a 1981 and it, uh, even when it was new in 1981 it would have put out about 85 at the engine and by the time I had acquired it and it had lived a quite hard life I, it was a bit of a rat bike it was and I did an engine rebuild on it not very well and it was basically down to about 60 horsepower you know it wasn't too, but I loved driving it was my first big multi-cylinder across the frame bike it was uh, you know I loved the thing but uh, after that you know I ended up on things like a uh, bandit 1200 things like that and I then sort of lost touch with the uh, sporty bikes and it was only when I came back when I realized just how much the state of the art of motorcycles has moved on and just how massively powerful they are these days but now that I'm back on a middleweight bike and it's the class of bike that I have that I, I now feel at home on I just love the amount of power that the bikes of this class produce it's got tons don't get me wrong it's yeah it's not a uh, 200 horsepower super bike but my god this has got far more than enough for the road it is fast as proverbial this bike it really is as they all are now back years ago this bike would have been a 750 but for the uh the introduction of uh 
of emissions laws and the uh, series of Euro laws that come out to curtail emissions, which at the end of the day, that kind of has to happen for us to have any kind of chance of getting a grip of climate change. And I'm not going to get into the politics of that. So, yeah, that has to happen. They do have to somehow curb the emissions of uh, internal combustion engines. So, manufacturers faced with this spectre of uh, ever strangulating emissions controls, which would rob a bike of its uh, power and its performance and its sensitivity on the throttle manufacturers would overcome this just by increasing the engine capacity because they could do that they could then get the power that they wanted the torque curve and the throttle response and the uh, and the mpg the uh, you know the the uh, range that they would get uh, that, that's what they want that's what they would get just by upping the engine capacity as has been latterly done by the uh, Ducati Panigale V4 were on release they made it an 1100 and in an interview with someone I actually read that they'd done that just to give it the characteristics that they would want for a road bike of a thousand cc albeit with Euro 4 regulations attached to it and so, yeah, it's, it's irrespective that this is an 850 or an 847, that the uh, Kawasaki Z750 is a 900, that the, uh, the Triumph is a 765. You know, that has been done to accommodate emissions rules, but they, they are still, at heart, 750s, in my opinion. And I kind of... I'm basing this bit of a, a vlog more on the sportier side of bikes. The uh, super nakeds, well this isn't a super naked but it's a naked sports bike nonetheless. Uh, and also I'm kind of missing ruining the demise of the 750 sports bike, the proper super sports bike, the fully fared race replica, because they have just died. The last one that was uh, being manufactured was the uh, was a Suzuki GSXR 750 and that has since uh, gone by the by. And it's a real sad shame because I think the average person riding on the road who loves their sports bikes, who wants to own a cutting edge, power, you know, fast, fun, agile bike, are really missing out now because you because you're buying uh, you, you buy a, a Yamaha R1, an Aprilia RSV4, uh, you know, a Fireblade, anything, anything of this generation now. You've got all that, but you just can't use it on the on the public roads anymore, and that's the real crying shame of it. And I conceived of this bit of a vlog after re-watching the various tests that uh, various journalists and professional racers have been making with the new class of Moto2 engine that's coming out in the MotoGP World Championship next year, which is the intermediate class. They are moving from the Honda CBR600 engine, which is a big old lump now, you know, it's an old engine. And they are going to the Triumph 765 lump. Now I've ridden that engine and it is superb and it is going to revolutionise that particular part of the championship and in order to test the engine and to get it right so that it's reliable and it works as a Moto2 engine Triumph have basically used the guts of a uh, Triumph Daytona 675 chassis with some very trick and fancy brakes and suspension and they basically made a kind of Moto 2-esque motorbike to test the uh, concepts out and everyone who's ridden that bike just raves about it just how good it is and people are saying why aren't Triumph making this bike the, the, the 765 Daytona for the road now it'd be an absolute winner but the market force probably isn't there for Triumph to do it and that's the real shame because if that bike could have existed 12 months ago when I was conceiving a notion to buy a smaller capacity bike if there had have been the Triumph Daytona six, uh, 765 basically a, tri a Daytona with the Street Triple RS engine in it man that would have been the bike I'd have been looking, looking at it really really would 
because that would just be so good it would be so so nimble so quick and but usable and the power would have been not too much but you could have had such good fun days out on it and you without breaking the law to such a degree that you'll get jail time because that's what the current thousand cc sports bikes are like you're trundling around everywhere in them in second gear second third gear because they in the uk the average you know the standard speed limit around towns is 30 miles per hour and i always found my r1 that it was always in a too high or too low gear it just didn't want to sit at that speed and it was a pain in the backside to ride at times now that wouldn't have been an issue with a daytona 765 or if they reinvented the gsxr 750 or if honda and suzuki uh, if honda and uh, kawasaki were to bring out 750 motorbikes again you would be able to have that day-to-day -day usability but without the drag of having to haul this thoroughbred sports bike which just does not want to be ridden slow because that's what they are like so yeah i do really really think that it's a sad lamentable thing that the 750 class has now become uh, resigned to bikes such as this and but then again these bikes do exist and they seem to be now grabbing a bit of a share of the market you know kawasaki have a really good engine in the seven the z900 and i know it's a 900 you know it's greatly larger than a 750 but it, it still is at heart the same power as a 750 again they've just done it to make the best of the, the uh, emissions legislation and see there are so many good bikes there now in the in the mid-range and i'm not really so much involving 600s in this because 600s albeit yes they are a, a midway bike uh, especially sport 600s they have plenty of power but you have to rev the clackers out of it to get that power you're going up to like 7, 16 17 thousand rpm to get maximum power you know and that's just not yeah it's not it's not feasible really is it outside of a racetrack so yeah bring back the 750 i say because we <laughs> it is so much fun kind of get it if you know you want the most powerful thing on the road and and straight from stock it's not enough power in it for you so you go and buy a full race exhaust system and get it dyno to get the most power out as you can but you're not going to be able to use that on the road sensibly and safely you know you're basically going to be a liability to yourself and others you know and if you are going to go out and do that if you're going to buy yourself a thousand cc sports bike then rather than up the engine power spend all that money that you were going to spend on a full Akropovich race exhaust system spend it on uh, suspension cartridges and a shop for the rear brake upgrades that's where you want to spend your money because trust me it has more than enough power as it is as does this little rascal as well and that's the thing that I'm taking away from this year's ride is just how much this little bike has invigorated me and you might be saying yeah Dave but I'm a big guy you know I need a big bike to sit on well I'm 210 pounds 95 kilos 15 stones whichever Imperial uh, SI unit you wish to work with you know I'm a big guy I'm six foot one and a bit I'm a heavy fellow and I don't feel overly big on this bike. This bike feels fine underneath me. So, yeah, you don't really need it. The only exception maybe is guys who like the big cruisers because they're a whole different genre of bike because they're not made for going around corners. So, yeah, you can have as big an engine as you want in them, <laughs> you know, so because you're never going to be uh, hooning it around a corner without... Uh, 
stick it into the weeds anyway because you, you won't have the brakes nor the handling to deal with it so yeah big cruisers aside and maybe the big touring bikes you know fair dues yeah because it's like my triumph tiger He's a 1200 and he works as a 1200 because he's a low revving, long distance mile muncher. But if you like your sports bikes and you think that the only alternative you have is a big 1000cc sports bike or a big massively torque wrenching super naked, well you are totally wrong. You don't need that to have fun. All you need is a Yamaha MT-09, a Triumph Street Triple, a Kawasaki Z900, a GSX-S 750. That's the kind of bike you need, and it's the kind of bike I highly recommend. You may disagree, you might say that no, power's where it's at, speed's where it's at, I don't care, I'm just going to... I'm just going to hoon it around the motorways at uh, 300 kilometres per hour. I'm going to scratch around country roads. I don't care. I don't give a monkeys. Devil take the hindmost. Well, if that's you, fair play. Good luck to you and try not to kill anyone else. That's all I would suggest. But uh, three, three plus decades now I've been riding on the road and I am... I am in my happy place now. I really, really am. This little bike has been the making of me this year. I absolutely adore it and I'm going to miss it so much over the winter. I really, really am. Ah, but I live in a transition climate. What can I do? <laughs> but anyway, all it will do, it will make me yearn for it over the winter and come spring, I'll be back out on this bad boy again. And hopefully uh, this won't be the last ride I get to have this year, although we are heading into a bit of a cold snap, so fingers crossed. Anyway, but stay tuned everyone. And I would urge people who are riding through the winter in the Western Hemisphere, please everyone be very, very careful. You know, keep those bikes shiny side up. Easy on the brakes, easy on the throttle, and don't lean it too far over. That's the best advice I can give you. Oh, and avoid the ironworks in the road and uh, shade in the corners in winter, because that's where the ice is. Yeah, I found that out in the, the hard way. So everyone, please take care, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.